We're now going to consider the questions in Assignment 6, Question 7. Construct proofs for the following more challenging problems. So before you start watching this, you should have already done the proof construction questions in Assignment 5, Exercise 2-4, as well as the proof construction questions in the first part of assignment 6, question 6, on the top half of the page. The ones in question 7, we're still confining ourselves to the eight basic rules, but we're now considering somewhat more complex situations where the sentences themselves aren't quite so simple. And the other thing is that the number of steps it's going to take us to demonstrate that if the now six premises are true, it's impossible for the conclusion to be false, are going to be a little bit greater in number. So it's important that your well-practiced, in spotting rule employment opportunities for the six, sorry, the five rules you set up for, and you're also used to using these three rules to, to strategically set up rule employment opportunities. With this particular proof, we can start off by noting the conclusion. The conclusion is a conjunction which is the strongest statement we can have in sentential logic. And when it's the conclusion, it is going to present the greatest challenge. In the best case scenario, we might have a sentence like B and tilde Y as the consequent of some conditional. So all we have to do is get the antecedent. We can then get the conclusion by modus ponens. In this particular case, however, the y-related information is one of the conjuncts in the conjunction in line 6. The b-related information is the consequent of a conditional which is itself the consequent of a larger conditional. This tells us that we're going to have to get B and tilde Y separately. So the last step of the proof then is going to be a conjunction step. So this is a little bit of an unusual way to end a proof. You can almost think of this as a double proof. We have two separate sub-goals we need to achieve. We need to get B then we need to get tilde y, and then the very last step of the proof will be conjunction. That being said, when we look over our premises, we quickly realize there are no rule employment opportunities available for the five rules you set up for. There is a conjunction, however, so we can proceed with the standard double simplification, 6, simp, 6, simp. One of the simplification steps when we get the left conjunct is tilde z. The second simplification step will give us tilde y. This is one of the conjuncts we need to finish off the proof. We're halfway done, so to speak, or we could say that one half of the proof is very short and very easy. The other half of the proof, getting this conjunct, B, will take a little more work. So there's no other use for tilde Y, but snapping tilde Z off line 6 opens up a rule employment opportunity from one of these five rules, namely modus tollens. So hopefully by this point you're finding it 
intuitive, where you're not having to, in a very mechanical fashion, look at the rules, look at what's required to employ a rule, but you've become familiar enough with these patterns that they begin to just pop out at you. Five and seven, then, are the rule employment requirements for modus tollens. Notice what we're going to get if we do five, seven modus tollens. We're going to get the antecedent of the conditional in five, which is already tilde h, with another tilde in front of it. It turns out that's going to be quite a useful thing for us to have because when we start on the next step and scan our now nine lines of available data, the one that hopefully pops out to you is four and nine, which satisfy the rule employment requirements for modus uh, sorry, disjunctive syllogism, not modus tollens, so that's 4, 9, disjunctive syllogism, and we get the other disjunct, which happens to have a tilde in front of it. We're moving along then, and we've now got 10 lines of available data the sentence pattern that's going to be of use to us here is 3 and 10 this is a modus tollens opportunity 3, 10 modus tollens is going to give us tilde w. Now, hopefully you're familiar enough to notice that lines 2 and 11, we don't have a rule employment opportunity, but we've got a situation where a, a strategic addition set up will give us the modus ponens rule employment opportunity. With that in mind then, 11 addition will give us tilde w or tilde t. We do that particular addition step, of course, so that we can do 2, 12 modus ponens to get the conjunction a and C. Now, in this particular case, we can see that we're going to have a use for both A and C, so we might do two simplifications in a row, or we might do one simplification followed by 114 modus ponens which will give us the somewhat complex consequent of the conditional in line 1 namely this smaller conditional now we go back and do our second simplification, which we could have done earlier, it really makes no difference. 13 simp c, and once again, we're going to have the two step addition set up for bonus ponens c or d. 16 addition. Finally, 15, 17 modus ponens.
will give us B. Okay, are we done then? Almost. What we've completed actually from lines 9 to 18 is having gotten tilde Y, the first of these two conjuncts very simply, it took us 10 lines to get the second conjunct so that now Eight, eighteen. Conjunction enables us to complete a proof. So that's a little bit rare or untypical to be able to complete a proof by conjunction. So notice that the rule employment strategy itself is no more complicated or difficult. It's just that in this proof, there's more of it, and you're much better off if you're familiar with rule employment before you start considering questions like this. Now we'll consider question 7H. We've got five premises this time, and we want to end up with the sentence tilde s. So, hopefully you can remember the five rules you set up for modus ponens, modus tollens, hypothetical syllogism, disjunctive syllogism, and CD. No opportunities to employ any of those rules. In line three, we've got our conjunction, so that's where we start. T and tilde x. At this point, it may not be crystal clear whether we're going to use both of those. Remember, though, it's not wrong to do two simplifications in a row, so we'll do them three simp. 3, simp. So those double simplifications will hopefully open up to us the opportunity to employ one of the rules that you set up for. Yes, they do. Hopefully you have no difficulty spotting the rule employment opportunity. 4, 7, disjunctive syllogism. It's going to give us the other disjunct, which is the user-friendly conjunction tilde W and tilde B. Here, we can see that there's more B-related information in line 1. There's also more W-related information. So, we might as well do another double simplification on line 8. 8 simp. H-simp tilde W tilde B. Again, we're not exactly sure how many lines this is going to take us, but from past experience, hopefully you, like I, have the feeling that it's going to be at least five more. So now we have T tilde X, tilde W, and tilde B. These are the most likely candidates to combine with other, one of the other more complex sentences in order to give us a rule employment opportunity involving one of the five rules you set up for. We don't have a rule employment opportunity right off the bat, but 1 in 10 
gives us the two-step addition setup opportunity tilde B or tilde C. So that's 10 addition so that now we can do 111 modus ponens to get the conditional A horseshoe W. Once we've got that, 9, 12 gives us another rule employment opportunity, this time a modus tollens, so we get the antecedent of 12 with a tilde in front of us. Lo and behold, 213, we've got another rule employment opportunity right off the bat. 213, this time modus ponens, will give us the consequent, which is a smaller conditional T horseshoe tilde Z. Finally, the simplification we did off line 3 is the very first step of the proof can be put to work. 614 modus ponens. And this gives us tilde Z. What we want is tilde S. How can we get tilde S? We notice in line 5 tilde Z is the antecedent of a conditional. So, we do a third modus ponens in a row. 5, 15 modus ponens. Maybe that's a little bit unusual, doing three modus ponens in a row. The important thing, though, is that we have the necessary information at our disposal, which allows us to carry out those three modus ponens in a row. The third modus ponens then, 515, gives us tilde S or X. And finally, we're getting close to demonstrating that if the first five sentences are true, Tilde S must be true as well. 716, disjunctive syllogism gives us the left disjunct, which is tilde S. So I'll leave the remainder of the proof construction questions for you in question 7, the second part of assignment 6. Now we can move on to assignment 7, which begins on page 14 of the file, Some Notes and Exercise Questions. As far as the logical rules we've been learning, we're about to substantially increase the number of rules we have to work with. So we've still got the five basic rules you set up for. These rules involve combining multiple lines of information. We've got the basic rules that you set up with, and we're now going to consider the ten equivalence rules. These equivalence rules are further, more fine-grained setup rules. If you look at page 13 of the Sum Notes and Exercise Questions, here's a photocopy of the rule sheet from one logic textbook of the standard set of rules that we're going to be learning. They've numbered them, even though there is no official numbering, but they've got the same basic rules we've set out. The only difference, instead of having a horizontal line dividing the lines of information you need to employ the rule, 
and the sentence you're entitled to infer when you have that information, they have a backslash triple dot thing. So we've completed the eight rules on the top half. We're now going to consider the ten rules on the bottom half of that sheet. So you might find the, uh, page 13 of the Sum Notes and Exercises file a valuable cheat sheet that you can keep with you and hopefully as you become increasingly familiar with the rules you'll need that sheet less and less or you may prefer to write out the rules in your own handwriting. Why do we need additional rules? Here's a situation that can arise that illustrates why we need the first equivalence rule we're going to consider. Suppose we have the following argument, where capital P stands for you paid your tuition on time or before the deadline, and capital S stands for the sentence, you lose or lost your spot on the class list. This is a familiar situation at many universities. The enrollment period allows you to reserve a spot on the class list, usually a couple of months before the semester begins, but you don't have to actually pay your tuition until two weeks before the semester begins, or something in that range. Now, the unfortunate uh, occurrence that can arise is that even though you reserved a spot on a particular class list two months ago, when you don't pay your tuition on time, you end up being bumped off of that, and those people on the waiting list will quickly occupy that spot. Consider the following argument. If you paid your tuition on time, then you won't lose your spot on the class list. Second premise. You did lose your spot on the class list. Therefore, you didn't or you must not have paid your tuition on time. Is that a valid argument? We're inclined to say yes, and in fact, a lot of people would be inclined to say that's just an example of modus tollens. So, one, two, modus tollens will give us that conclusion. Even though this inference is undoubtedly modus tollens like, there is a definite modus tollens element in this inference. It's not actually a modus tollens inference. To illustrate this, we have to get kind of picky and a little bit technical. Let's go back to the basic rules and consider what I'll now, sorry, consider what I will now call the modus tollens procedure. Whenever you have two sentences with form or underlying logical structure A, that is to say a conditional and the consequent of that conditional with a tilde in front of it in either order, you can infer or deduce a third sentence with form B. The antecedent of the conditional with a tilde in front of it. So, do we have a conditional and the consequent with a tilde in front of it? If we count line one as the conditional that we have, then the sentence P, and remember, these lower case letters indicate that it can be any sentence, no matter how simple, no matter how complex. 
as long as it occurs both here and here, and the same with Q as long as it occurs both here and here. So we can count, confusingly enough, capital P for the simple sentence, or sorry, for the sentence indicated by the lowercase p, but when we come to Q, with the conditional we have, Q isn't S, it's tilde S. So in order to have information that's patterned after form or underlying logical structure A, we would have to have in addition, the sentence tilde, tilde s. Because in order for line one to be a conditional of the form P horseshoe Q, Q has to be tilde s, and so tilde Q has to be tilde tilde s. Now, we don't have tilde tilde s. What we have is a sentence that is equivalent to tilde tilde s. What we have is a sentence that has to be true if tilde tilde s is true, and a sentence that, if it is true, then tilde tilde s has to be true, but we don't have what we need to do a modus tollens. So we haven't satisfied the modus tollens procedure. As we saw earlier though, with addition adjustments, we can make an adjustment using one of the equivalence rules in order to transform our information into a form where it does satisfy the modus tollens requirements, what we have to do is the following. On line two, we would do a double negation step. That is to say, we would transform S into the equivalent sentence tilde, tilde S. Now, we've got, on lines 1 and 3, information that satisfies the modus tollens requirements. We've got a conditional, and the consequent of that conditional, with a tilde in front of it. So that entitles us to infer the antecedent of a conditional with a tilde in front of it, which would be tilde p. You didn't pay your tuition on time. Now, here's the situation. Since, by now hopefully, modus ponens, which is a simple enough inference, now that you've familiarized yourself with it, Hopefully it seems to you pretty easy and straightforward. Double negation is a simple and straightforward inference. You were all aware of this, although you didn't know that it actually had a name. And it's very easy for a human being to combine two separate inferences together a double negation and a modus tollens, and count those two inferences as if they were one. And this is the problem we have to avoid. What we want to do is specify each inference that's made in an argument that demonstrates that if all the premises are true, then it's impossible for the conclusion to be false. And Double negation is exactly the rule we need to do this. Before we move on 
to consider a number of concrete examples of proofs that contain the employments of various equivalence rules, let's pause to consider two important differences between basic rules and equivalence or, as they're sometimes called, replacement rules. Here's the first difference. Basic rules are uni or one-directional. They always work downwardly. For example, we've got modus tollens here, which says whenever you have a conditional and the consequent of that conditional with a tilde in front of it, you're entitled to validly infer the antecedent of that conditional with a tilde in front of it. The rule modus tollens does not work in the other direction. Simply by knowing that P is false, you can't validly infer these two sentences. These two sentences may or may not also be true if tilde P is true. On the other hand, going in the downward direction, if these two sentences are true, then tilde P has to be true as well. So the basic rules only work downwardly. Equivalence rules, in contrast, are bidirectional. And rather than setting them up in this vertical scheme, it's more useful to set out the equivalence rules in a horizontal fashion and think of them as being able to be used right to left or left to right. So here's the template for the first of the ten equivalence rules, which I've already mentioned, double negation. This sentence over here is lowercase p, which, as you recall, means any sentence. If you have any sentence, then double negation entitles you to validly infer that exact same sentence with two tildes in front of it. Wayne is in the room, therefore, it's not the case that Wayne isn't in the room. You can also, though, use double negation in a right-to-left direction. If you have any doubly negated sentence, and recall the way the tilde works, no additional brackets are necessary, this innermost tilde applies to the first sentence immediately to the right of it, which is P. The outermost tilde refers to the first sentence immediately to the right of it, which is tilde P. So, no additional brackets are necessary. Any sentence that's doubly negated, you can switch for that exact same sentence with both tildes removed. That's the double negation rule. The second important difference between basic rules and equivalence rules is that the logical operations that the basic rules license or allow you to carry out must be applied to entire lines. On the other hand, the logical operations that the equivalence rules license or allow you to do can be applied to entire lines or to parts of lines. This is important because a common mistake occurs with some people as far as the two one-line basic rules namely simplification and addition. With these two basic rules, you need one line of information and from that you can carry out the logical operation allowed by that basic rule in order to derive validly a new line of information. 
we never really noticed this before, but it's important to pause and point this out clearly. That's only allowed when the basic logical operation allowed by the rule is applied to the entire line. Here's a couple of quick examples. In this first little um, bit of reasoning, we've got two sentences. The first sentence is a conditional. If you're in Calgary, then you're in Alberta. True as a matter of geographical fact. The second sentence says, you're in Surrey. Which, if you are in Surrey, as many of us are, that's true as a function of where we are. Suppose someone's uh, decided, though, well, I'm going to do an addition step not on the entire conditional, but just on the antecedent. So I'm going to make C into the disjunction S or C so that by addition We will have the new conditional, if you're in Surrey or Calgary, then you're in Alberta. Then I will just do addition on line two. If you're in Surrey, you are in Surrey or Calgary. Now, three, four modus ponens will give us you're in Alberta. Something's clearly gone wrong here. If these two sentences are true, which they are for many of us, if you're in Calgary, then you're in Alberta, that's true for everyone as a matter of geographical fact. But if it's also true that you're in Surrey, you better not be able to derive the conclusion that you're in Alberta. What's gone wrong here? What's gone wrong here is this second important difference has been ignored. The first addition step is not allowed because what you're doing is applying the basic rule addition not to the entire line but only to part of the line, namely the antecedent. And that's what causes us to end up in this situation where we're driving a clearly false conclusion from two true premises. So you can certainly do an addition on line one, but since addition is a basic rule, the addition has to be applied to the entire line, that is to say to the entire conditional. So if you did addition on line one correctly, you would end up with, if you're in Calgary, then you're in Alberta, or you're in Surrey. And from that, you're not going to be able to derive the conclusion that's false. A second example involving simplification. Here's a true sentence. If you pay your tuition and enroll in a course, then you're registered in the course. Suppose it's also true that someone has enrolled in a particular course, but not paid their tuition. What if that person were to say, well, I'm going to do, so these are our two premises, I'm going to go one, simplification, not on the entire line, but just on part of the line. I will simplify the conjunction, which is the antecedent of that conditional, and just snap off E. From there, three, four modus ponens, or sorry, um, to three modus ponens, 
will give us the conclusion that you're registered in the course. Once again, simply from our two original premises, if you've paid your tuition and enrolled, then you're registered in the course. And second, you've enrolled in the course, we've got this false conclusion, you're registered in the course. The problem is that simplification this time was erroneously applied to part of the first line. You can't do simplifications on conjunctions which are parts of lines. You can only do the simplification rule when the entire line is a conjunction. All right, that being said, we can now consider an example of using an equivalence rule in a way that is applied to only a part of a line, but this logical procedure is allowed. So the two sentences we have here are, if you're in Canada, then it's false that you're not in North America. That's true, right? If you're in Canada, it's just false that you're outside of North America. Second premise, if you're in North America, then you're in the Western Hemisphere. So these are both true sentences as a matter of geographical fact. Notice, though, they aren't set up in quite a way that will allow us to do a hypothetical syllogism. We don't have the consequent of one identical to the antecedent of the other. The consequent of one is equivalent to the antecedent of the other, but it's not identical. That can be fixed, or rather we can use the double negation rule to set up for the hypothetical syllogism, this time by applying the double negation rule not to the entire line, but just to the consequent, and we will be doing a right to left double negation where if you're in Canada, then it's false that you're not in North America, will just become if you're in Canada, then you're in North America, so after that double negation setup step, we could then do two, three hypothetical syllogism to get if you're in Canada, then you're in the Western Hemisphere. Very important then to be aware of these two fundamental differences between basic rules on the one hand and equivalence or replacement rules on the other hand. At this point, we can consider question 5 on exercise 4.6, which is on page 14 of the sum notes and exercise file. At the top of that page, it says assignment 7, part A. Right after exercise 4, 6, it says, complete the following proofs which emphasize the rules DN and capital D, lowercase e, capital M. Those three letters are the abbreviation for the word De Morgan's. There was an 19th century mathematician logician named Augustus de Morgan who first set out the conditions for a pair of related equivalences and for various reasons he got this rule named after him. In some logic textbooks, it's called De Morgan's Law or De Morgan's Laws, since there are two versions. In some, it's called De Morgan's Principle or Principles. In the sheet of rules on page 13 of the Sum Notes and Exercises, it's called De Morgan's Theorem. I'm just going to call it De Morgan's. 
So the abbreviation for De Morgan's capital D, lowercase e, capital M. It's an abbreviation of Augustus de Morgan's name, the person after whom this rule was named. For de Morgan's, you have to have either a negated conjunction or a negated disjunction. And the validity of these two transformation rules was illustrated, if you recall, in the symbolization questions in assignment one. When we're considering the negated conjunction, there are three different ways a conjunction can be false. If one of the conjuncts is false, the left one, let's say, and the right one is true, the conjunction is still false. If the right conjunct is true, but the left one's false, the conjunction is still false. And finally, if both conjuncts are false, the conjunction is false. So there's three different ways that the negation of a conjunction can be true. There's only one way that the negation of a conjunction can be false, namely when both conjuncts are false. That's equivalent to a non-negated disjunction of two sentences, and they don't necessarily have to be simple, but those two sentences have to be examples of the two in the conjunction with the brackets around it with a tilde in front of it. A disjunction with two disjuncts, each of which are negated, can also be true in three different ways. If this one is true, meaning P is false, even though this one is false, the conjunction is still true. If this one is true, meaning Q is false, even though this one is false, it's still true. If they're both false, it's still true. The only way a non-negated disjunction can be false is when both disjuncts are false. And if both disjuncts have a tilde in front of them, then the only way that disjunction can be false is if both of the things that have a tilde in front of them are true. And that's the same over here. If both of these same things are true, then the negation of the conjunction is false. Then we have the negated disjunction, a much more definite statement. There's only one way a disjunction can be false, namely if both disjuncts are false. Otherwise, the disjunction is true. And this corresponds to a non-negated conjunction. There's only one way a conjunction can be true, if both conjuncts are true. And if both conjuncts have one of these disjuncts with a tilde in front of it, then the only way this conjunction can be true is when P is false, so that tilde P is true, and Q is false, so that tilde Q is true. Otherwise, it's going to be false, as is this one. So, De Morgan's allows us to unlock negated conjunctions or disjunctions into a non-negated equivalent sentence. Here's a straightforward example of the most common useful feature of De Morgan's. So we've got two premises. It's not the case that both F and G are true. Second premise, F is true. From that, we conclude that G must be false. Obviously, can't apply any of the basic rules to that, and even the basic setup rules don't seem to offer us any way out. What we need to do is a De Morgan's on line one. So, what we're doing here is a top left to top right De Morgan's. We start with the negated conjunction 
the two conjuncts are non-negated, we make it a non-negated disjunction, but each of the two former conjuncts become disjuncts with a tilde in front of them. Now, we're at a situation we've seen before where we are close to being able to apply the disjunctive syllogism rule, but we don't quite have the negation of the left disjunct in three. We can get that though by doing a second equivalent setup, namely double negation on line two to get tilde, tilde f. Now, three, four, disjunctive syllogism gives us tilde g, the other disjunct. So that's a nice simple example of the use of De Morgan's along with double negation to construct a proof that if these two sentences are true, then g must be false. At this point, very briefly, I'll just pause to notice that if you look at lines 1 and line 2, line 1 says both f and g aren't true. Second line says f is true. It's pretty straightforward then. Well, if both of them are true and the left one is, then the right one must be false. So, this is a reasonable question to ask, I think. Why don't we have a rule that says anytime you have a negated conjunction along with one of the conjuncts, you can always validly derive the negation of the remaining con uh, conjunct, which is true. That's a valid inference, and this could be a potential rule. Here's the situation, though. Here's the broad picture. Here's why we don't do that. What we're learning is the basic 20 rule system of logic, which is a happy medium of all the possible systems of logical rules we could adopt. The simplest possible system of logical rules contains only three rules. And what I mean by the simplest possible system is the simplest possible complete system of logic. That is, a system of logical rules that will allow us to construct proofs for every valid argument or pattern of inference that there is. So, this is what we are driving towards, a complete system of logic. Well, why are we driving towards a complete system of logic containing 20 rules? Wouldn't it be much better to have a system containing three rules? The answer is, well, as far as memorizing rules goes, it would be much better, but the disadvantage of having a three-rule system of logic is that many of the sentences are much longer and more complex than they are with our system of five connectives because the three-rule system it uses negation, but also a couple of connectives we aren't considering. But the other very important reason is that the proofs in general are going to be much, much longer. And human beings aren't too good at constructing proofs that are 50, 100, several hundred lines long. If we have a system that has more rules and more connectives, the proofs by and large are going to be substantially shorter than they would be if we just had a three-rule system. 
At this point, though, someone might reasonably say, well, why don't we add a whole bunch of rules, such as the one suggested here, whenever you have a negated conjunction in a simple sentence, you can derive the negation of the other sentence. The answer is that it's difficult for human beings to remember separate rules. We could have, for example, a 50 or 60 rule system. That would make, by and large, the proofs much shorter and more straightforward. But the problem is the human mind can't remember clearly that many different logical relation rules. So what we're learning with this basic 20 rule system is a happy medium, so to speak. The proofs are doable. They could be shorter with a much more complicated system, but they could also be much, much longer. On the other hand, a 20 rule system, especially if we have a sheet of the rules, is something that a human mind can manage. If we had 60 rules, could you imagine having three pages of different rules you'd have to keep track of? Even though the proofs would be shorter, human beings would find it very difficult determining which rules are called for in various situations. So, even though this rule in isolation might seem to make sense having any time you have a negated conjunction in a sentence you can validly derive the negation of the other conjunct. When we consider things in terms of systems of rules it's not reasonable to include this rule on our system because it doesn't come up frequently enough and the set of 20 rules is a much more strategically advantageous system of logic for human beings to adopt. So this is why we're considering things in these terms. And notice, with the strategic employment of De Morgan's and double negation, we can set this, these two premises up for a straightforward disjunctive syllogism. So this is, in the big picture, the most advantageous way to do this proof. The last question we will consider from exercise 4.6 is question 10. We've got a conditional where both the antecedent and the consequent are negated, but the conditional itself isn't negated. Then we've got a negated disjunction, where one of the disjuncts is negated. Then we've got a non-negated disjunction of simple sentences. If these three sentences are true, then D must be true. Can you see that? No. Well, now we can construct a proof that that is so, and we can explain ourselves in terms of a series of steps, each of which have names that are recognized by other people. So how is the proof going to proceed? No opportunity to apply any of the basic rules you set up for there's always opportunities to apply um, conjunction or addition. I can't see any advantageous ones, nor is there an opportunity to apply simplification. So we need to set things up. Here's another standard recommendation in logic textbooks. Anytime you have a negated conjunction or disjunction, use De Morgan's to unlock the information there. So this time we will be proceeding from the bottom left 
to the bottom right. Notice that the left disjunct inside the negated disjunction, and that's going to be P, is tilde A. So when we do two De Morgan's, the negated disjunction is going to become a non-negated conjunction. The right disjunct B is going to become the right conjunct tilde B. The left disjunct tilde A is going to become the left conjunct tilde tilde A. Does this help us at all? Well, this allows us to now carry out the simplification setup rule on line 4. And once again, we could do two simplifications in a row. And along with that, we could do a double negation on the left conjunct to neaten it up to A. But if we notice our remaining information, there is no further use for A-related information when it comes to demonstrating that if these three sentences are true, then D is true. So if you did the two simplifications, you're not going to get any marks off because they are correct rule employments. But I'm just going to do the single simplification step to get tilde B. De Morgan's simplification. Now we're set up for a modus ponens. 1, 5 modus ponens is going to give us tilde C. Finally, 3, 6 disjunctive syllogism will give us not tilde D but D. So there's an example of De Morgan's in a second useful uh, proof situation. One last issue to consider as far as the first two of our equivalence rules double negation and De Morgan's go, are these two rules valid rules? That is to say, are both of these rules set up so that if the sentence you start off with is true, or assumed to be true, then the sentence that each of these rules allows you to infer must also be true. Notice that since these rules are bidirectional, there are two things we have to check. We have to ensure ourselves first that if the sentence P is true, it's impossible for the denial of its negation to be true. And we also have to ensure ourselves that if a doubly negated sentence is true, then that sentence without any negations must also be true. We can assure ourselves that double negation is a valid rule of inference in both directions by our intuitive reactions to various concrete examples of such sentences we might consider or by using the truth table. Double negation is simple enough that if it's true that Wayne's in the room, we can all see it has to be true that it's false that Wayne isn't in the room. By the same token, the claim it's false that Wayne isn't in the room, for that to be true, it must be the case that Wayne is in the room. De Morgan's is a little more complicated, but it's still a relatively straightforward reflection of our symbolization understanding. We can start with the top left. If a 
conjunction is false, and remember there's three different ways for a conjunction to be false. One conjunct is false, but not the other, or the second conjunct is false, but not the first, or both of them are false. This somewhat vague commitment about how the world is, indicated by the negated conjunction, is also indicated by the non-negated disjunction where both of the disjuncts are negated. What's being maintained there is P is false or Q is false or both of them. Exactly the conditions that make the negated conjunction true. Similar considerations apply to the negated disjunction, except that we've got a much more exact commitment here. There's only one way a negated disjunction can be true, and that is if both disjuncts are false. This is the same thing that's indicated by a non-negated conjunction of two negated sentences. There's only one way that conjunction can be true, when both of those sentences are false. So, double negation and De Morgan's are clear examples of valid rules of inference, valid bidirectional rules of inference. Indeed, De Morgan's is a valid bidirectional rule of inference with two versions. But we want to ensure that every version of every rule we adopt in the equivalence rules is valid in both directions. We don't want to allow the possibility of any invalid inferences being made in our rules. Otherwise, we can't be certain that for proofs we construct, We've demonstrated that if the sentences we start off with are all true, then the sentence we derive from them by correctly employing the rules we've allowed ourselves to use, that that last sentence we derive can't be false. With that in mind, we can now consider the three equivalence horseshoe rules. So, we considered the three basic horseshoe rules, modus ponens, modus tollens, and hypothetical syllogism, were not, and they, each of those were two-line rules, examples of the basic rules you set up for. Now we're going to consider the three equivalence horseshoe rules. These rules are one-line rules if they're applied to entire lines, or they can be applied to parts of lines. Not only that, like all equivalence rules, they work bidirectionally. With that in mind, let's start off with the first one. It's called contraposition. The abbreviation for this is contra. And from any conditional, so we start off lowercase p, lowercase q, so this could be any conditional, what further sentence has to follow from any conditional? Well, let's start with a simple example. Let's say we've got, if you're in Surrey, then you're in British Columbia. What follows from that? Well, if we keep in mind modus tollens, which is unquestionably a valid rule, what does modus tollens tell us? Well, it tells us that this conditional, if you're in Surrey, then you're in British Columbia, if it were to be paired with the simple sentence, you're in British Columbia, or sorry, you're not in British Columbia, the negation of the simple sentence, which is the consequent of that conditional, then the negation of the antecedent has to follow from these two sentences. 
Another way of putting that same information is to say if the, the conditional if you're in Surrey then you're in British Columbia is true, then the conditional if you're not in British Columbia then you're not in Surrey has to be true because in unit combination with the conditional if you're in Surrey then you're in British Columbia and the sentence you're not in British Columbia we're forced to derive you're not in Surrey another way of saying that is if it's true that if you're in Surrey then you're in British Columbia it must also be true that if you're not in British Columbia then you're not in Surrey another a uh, way to explain the situation here, if you recall we can have a conjunction, a disjunction, and a conditional that all have you're in Surrey on the left hand side, you're in British Columbia on the right hand side. If we change the order so that we've got you're in British Columbia and you're in Surrey we're not changing the commitment being made by the conjunction the same holds for the disjunction with the conditional though if we change the order we are changing the nature of the commitment this sentence as a matter of geographical fact is true. If you're in Surrey, then you're in British Columbia. There's nowhere you could be where it's true that you're in Surrey, where it's not also true that you're in British Columbia. On the other hand, the sentence, if you're in British Columbia, then you're in Surrey, is false, because there's numerous different places you could be where it's true you're in British Columbia, and it's false here in Surrey. Notice though that if we switch the order of the antecedent and the consequent and also put a tilde in front of both of them after we've switched the order we end up with the conditional if you're not in British Columbia then you're not in Surrey. And once again, we can ask ourselves, there's no way, no possible way for it to be true that you're in Surrey, where it's not also true that you're in British Columbia. Well, let's consider this conditional. The antecedent is, you're not in British Columbia. Once again, there's no way for it to be true that you're not in British Columbia, unless it's also true that you're not in Surrey. So these two conditionals where the order of the antecedent and consequent is switched but tildes are put in front of the two switched sentences are called contrapositives of each other and these two sentences are equivalent. So this is the first of the three equivalence horseshoe rules. Contraposition. For any conditional, you can always validly derive another conditional where the antecedent and the consequent are switched, but, and it's very important that the second factor is included, you put a tilde in front of both. And since these two sentences are equivalent, it's also valid that any time you have a conditional where the antecedent and the consequent both have a tilde in front of, it, front of them, if you both remove those tildes and switch the order, you're going to have a sentence that makes the same logical commitment and therefore is true whenever the sentence you started off with is true. 
So with the contraposition rule, in either direction, if the sentence you start off with is true, it's impossible for the sentence you end up with to be false. From here, we can move to the second of the three equivalence horseshoe rules that can be applied to every conditional. This second horseshoe equivalence rule allows us to replace any conditional with a logically equivalent disjunction. Conditionals and equivalents, or sorry, conditionals and disjunctions are logically equivalent in the sense that they both make somewhat vague commitments about how the world is. So, we can exchange a conditional for an equivalent disjunction as long as we ensure that the disjunction we exchange for that conditional is always true whenever the conditional we started off with is true. So, what does it mean to commit ourselves to a conditional? P horseshoe Q. So once again, if you're in Surrey, then you're in British Columbia. Are you committing yourself to the claim that you're in Surrey? When you um, say, if you're in Surrey, then you're in British Columbia? No. This conditional holds regardless of whether or not you're in Surrey. It holds for everyone. Are we committing ourselves to your being in British Columbia? No, because again, this holds for even if you're in Europe, it's still true. If you're in Surrey, then you're in British Columbia. So what exact commitment about how the world is, is being maintained when someone asserts the conditional, if you're in Surrey, then you're in British Columbia. Well, what's being maintained, or another way of looking at it, is you're saying the possibility of your both being in Surrey, yet not being in British Columbia, can't hold. That's what's being maintained by anyone asserting a conditional. They're saying it's not possible for you to be in Surrey and yet not be in British Columbia at the same time. Whenever you're in Surrey, you're also in British Columbia. So, let's start off with this sentence. If we do a De Morgan's to this negated conjunction where the right conjunct is negated, we're going to end up with tilde S or tilde tilde B. If we do a little neatening up on part of that line, so we'll leave the tilde S or part exactly the way it is, we'll change tilde tilde B to just B, then we'll end up with a disjunction where the left disjunct is negated. So from a conditional, by recognizing its underlying logical implications to be a negated conjunction, then doing De Morgan's and double negation, we end up with a negated dis or sorry, a non-negated disjunction where the left disjunct is negated, but the right one isn't. So, the way this would come out in our rule template would be that for any conditional P horseshoe Q, we can always 
replace that with the following disjunction, tilde p or q. So the claim is, that whenever this conditional is true, it's impossible for this disjunction to be false. Well, let's now consider it from the other direction, because remember, these rules are bidirectional, so this rule not only entitles us to validly deduce the disjunction tilde p or q from any sentence p horseshoe q, but it also entitles us from any disjunction tilde p or q to derive the conditional p or q. So we've shown that this rule of inference, which is called implication, IMPL is the abbreviation, works in the rightward direction, but let's see if it works in the leftward direction. So we've begun with the sentence tilde p or q. Can we be certain that if tilde p or q is ever true, it's impossible for the conditional p horseshoe q to be false? Well, look at it this way. Suppose we start off with a disjunction, tilde p or q. So what's the claim here? Well, the claim is at least one of tilde p or q is true. So possibly tilde p is true, q is false. Possibly tilde p is false which means p is true and q is false, or tilde p is true and q is true. What about the conditional? Well, if tilde p is true, then the disjunction has to be true. Right? But what if tilde p is false? Which is to say, tilde tilde p is true, which is to say that p is true. In other words, what has to be the case if this disjunction is true, but this disjunct tilde p is false? What has to be is that q must be true, because if tilde p is false, and q is false, then the disjunction is false. So whenever tilde p is false, q has to be true. And whenever tilde p is false, tilde tilde p has to be true, which is just to say that p has to be true. So in other words, whenever p is true, q has to be true. You can never have a situation where P is true and Q is false. And that's exactly the same thing that's being maintained by the conditional, P horseshoe Q. You can't have a situation where P is tr true and Q is false. That's what you're committing yourself to with P horseshoe Q. So, it turns out then, although I will admit it's not as easy or simple or straightforward to satisfy yourself that P horseshoe Q can't be true at the same time that this one is false, nor can this one be true at the same time that this one is false. So these are valid rules of inference but it's not quite as straightforward as some of the other ones to prove that they're valid. Now we can move on to the third of our three equivalence horseshoe rules. 
This one, unlike the first two, doesn't apply to any conditional. You have to have a kind of specific conditional. Namely, a conditional that has a conjunction as its antecedent. A conditional that says, if P and Q are both true, then R is true. This third rule says that if that's so, then if P is true, then Q horseshoe R must be true. So this particular rule is called exportation. The abbreviation is EXP. And the reason it's called exportation is that the middle sentence Q gets exported from the antecedent of the conditional on the left to the consequent of the conditional on the right, and vice versa. I remember myself, I wondered about this one, whether it is indeed valid. Well, let's consider a couple of examples. If you recall an earlier example, your tuition is, in, is paid, you're enrolled in the course, you're registered in the course, we could have the sentence, if your tuition is paid and you're enrolled in the course, then you're registered in the course. So, what we want to focus on, though, is does that sentence entail the truth of this sentence? If your tuition is paid, then, if you're enrolled, then you're registered in the course. Which it does, that makes sense. For someone to say, both of these things have to be true, in order for the third thing to be true, is just another way of saying, if the first thing is true, then, if the second thing is true, then the third thing is true. Well, what about in the other direction. Okay. Is it definitely correct that if the first thing is true, then if a second thing is true, then the third thing is true, if this conditional with a smaller conditional as its consequent, if that's true, does it have to be the case that a conditional with a conjunction as its antecedent has to also be true. Yes, it does, if we think about it. This one says, if T is true, then if E is true. So in other words, if this and this are both true, then the third sentence has to be true. And another way of saying that is just, if this and this are both true, then the third sentence has to be true. Thus, takes a little bit more thought to ensure ourselves that all three of the horseshoe equivalence rules are indeed valid in both directions. And the difficulty here is related to the fact that the conditional unlike the conjunction, disjunction, and negation, doesn't neatly fit into truth tables. It's not a purely truth functional connective, but 
that doesn't prevent us from being able to assure ourselves that these three equivalent horseshoe rules involving transformations with conditionals aren't all valid. So we can safely add contraposition, implication, and exportation to our set of valid rules. We can use two questions from exercise 4.8 on the bottom part of page 14 in order to illustrate a concrete example of the three equivalent horseshoe rules. The first question is as follows. If A and B are both true, then C must be true. Second premise, A is true. Conclusion, B horseshoe C must be true. How can we construct a proof that if sentences 1 and 2 are true, then the third one, or sorry, the assigned conclusion up here, cannot be false? With this one, you have to see that the first premise is an example of a sentence where we can apply the exportation rule left to right. If you don't see the exportation opportunity, you could be staring at that particular proof for quite a while. In general, it's worth considering seriously anytime you see a conditional with a conjunction as the antecedent whether you should do an exportation step. It's not always the way to go, but it often is. With that in mind, if we did the setup rule one exportation, that would give us a horseshoe, and here's where the B gets exported from the antecedent to the consequent B horseshoe C. Having done the exportation setup step, the remainder of the proof is, I hope you'll agree, pretty easy and straightforward because we've set ourselves up for an application of the modus ponens rule. We can now move to question three. Here we've got the disjunction tilde n or n. At least one of those is true. Then we've got the conditional. If r is not true, then n is not true. From that, might not strike you immediately, a third sentence, namely if m is true, then r is true, must also be true. Can we provide a proof of that? My suggestion, whenever you've got a mixture of disjunctions and conditionals, is set up for the hypothetical syllogism. So line two is already a conditional. Can we convert line one into a conditional? Yes, we can by employing the implication rule. Here we're going to do apply the rule on the full line using a right-to-left application. So one implication will make tilde m or n into m horseshoe n. Now we've got two conditionals but in order to apply hypothetical syllogism, we have to have two conditionals where the antecedent of one is identical to the consequent of the other. Suppose we then decided, all right, we're going to do three contraposition. And here this is going to be a left to right. 
So M horseshoe N is going to become tilde N horseshoe tilde M. Now we've got the antecedent of one of our conditionals tilde N, the consequent of the other one tilde N. So two for hypothetical syllogism will allow us to validly infer the new conditional if tilde r then tilde m. Notice the conclusion we're after is m horseshoe r so we will have to do a second contraposition on line 5 this time a right to left to give us M horseshoe R. So here we did an implication and contraposition as set up steps which led us to the hypothetical syllogism. Then we had to do a final contraposition adjustment after the hypothetical syllogism step to get the assigned conclusion. I'm guessing a fair number of you noticed that we can get this same conclusion instead of using four steps. So this is entirely correct what I've just shown you. The reason it's entirely correct is it's four individual applications of one of are valid rules to some subset of the available information. Some of you might have noticed though, well, we could get the antecedent of one of the lines two and three and the consequent of the other to match by doing a left to right contraposition on line three, but we could also get that match by doing a right-to-left contraposition on line 2. So that is to say, going this way to this way would give us the following conditional from line 2 by contraposition. Then, 3, 4, hypothetical syllogism ends up completing the proof for us in three steps instead of four. We've got two setup steps. The proof ends with the hypothetical syllogism. Either of the ways I just showed you are entirely correct. You're not required to do the shortest possible proof. You've you're required simply to construct a series of inference steps that starts with our original premises and ends with the conclusion. So this will end the second of our proof construction videos. At this point, I'll emphasize again because this cannot be emphasized enough, you have to have done all of the exercise questions on exercise 4-6, which is assignment 7, part A, the first part of that, as well as all of the proof construction questions in assignment 5 and assignment 6. What I'm doing in the lectures is demonstrating for you theoretically that all of the rules we're using are indeed valid, and I'm giving a few examples of the concrete ways in which these rules are applied. But the part I can't teach you, the part that it's crucial for you to do in order to understand this material in the way you need to, is for you to do proof construction questions. It turns out that the proof construction questions on exercise 4-8, you're now in a position to do some but not all of them. So make sure before you go to the next video that you've done all of the proof construction questions in assignment 5, 
all of the proof construction questions in assignment six, which has two parts, and all of the proof construction questions in exercise four, six. And by the end of the next video, you will be able to do all of the proof constructions in exercise four, eight, as well as a couple of other exercises.